I've used the stereo strings myself for at least 30 years, if not more. Everybody who comes in here, with very, very few exceptions, plays the stereo strings. And they didn't get there because of any reason except dependability and tone. Hey everybody, I'm Ted Drozdowski, Editorial Director of Premier Guitar, and today we are visiting with Mike Baguetta and Mike Watt of MSSV, Main Steam Stop Valve, and uh, man, I love this band. Sonny Schrock is one of my favorite guitar players, and Sonny said that he was always looking to find the terror and the beauty in one song. These guys find the terror and the beauty in one song, and it's it's marvelous. Mike, it's good to see you again. Thanks for having us. Always this is Mike Baguette, by the way. To see you. And uh, this band is Mike's idea. Uh, they're going to be making their third album at the end of this tour. That's they're right. 50 dates in, right? You said. Uh, yeah, this is show 50, and we've got uh, nine more to go. Nine more to go, including tonight. And we haven't played of, it yet. And everybody who comes, new music, right? Yeah, we have all the new music worked into the set, so we're touring the new album that's out called Human Reaction, which we recorded at the end of last year's tour. That was 48 shows in 48 days. So 49.50, we made that record. It's out. We're touring that, but we're also touring the brand new material that we're going to record days 59 and 60, and that'll come out whenever, you know, the gods sprinkle their little record fairy <laughs> dust on the thing. <laughs> well, I love Mike's vocabulary as a guitar player, and, and part of his language is his use of effects the whammy bar, which he's a master at, and just his selection of instruments, too. Mike's gear is always marvelous, so why don't you tell us about it, and let's start with that Cole. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, I got to meet uh, Saul Cole, I uh, forget when, I was living in New York City, it might have been 2013, 2014, but I, I met him through uh, my friend David Torn, who had had a guitar built for him by Saul called the Tornado, which this is uh, my own version of, of one of Cole's Tornadoes. and. Um, you know, I kind of got into the idea of the whammy bar as sort of like this really vocal, evocative kind of effect on the guitar. It's not just good for like horse sound effects, you know. Um, <laughs> but that's another thing that I, I got really into listening to David Torn and Jeff Beck, the way that they kind of can barely touch this thing and make it evoke all these kind of vocal qualities. So the first thing I did was I got like an old Mexican Strat and my dad and I like kind of hollowed out the cavity in the back so that you can pull up on the bar and get, um, you know, kind of... <laughs> kind of bigger bends than you usually would without having to go the Floyd Rose, Rose yeah. route and kind of clipping the strings and all that kind of lose and sustain kind of deal. Um, so anyways, Torn's, the Tornado that Cole made for David Torn, that was like really beautiful instrument to me and David's always been a big inspiration and uh, really generous with his knowledge and he's taught me a lot about kind of using the whammy bar and touch and all that so definitely owe him a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, and so, I, anyways, I got to meet Saul and we talked about kind of building an instrument and um, here we are with this one. I have another one, I have a Cole Superior which is a little faster, a little lighter, a little smaller at home and I think he's building me a third one now which is another Tornado with a different set of pickups. Uh, but yeah, it's just a real treat to play. I can play on anything but I like playing on this, so. Yes. Well, it's a very distinctive guitar, too, starting with the tuning pegs. Do you mind just taking us from nose to tail? Yeah, for sure, yeah. I think, uh, I think a lot of stuff is hip shot. These tuning pegs are hip shot. They are locking tuners, but not because I need them with the whammy bar usage. They're locking tuners because it allows for a faster string change on stage mm -hmm. instead of having to do a bunch of wraps and getting out with the drill press and stuff. Um, these, they'll pull in, they'll lock in the back, and then I just twist them up. They're cylindrical, which is kind of like just a uh, dealer's choice. They just kind of look cool. So <laughs> they do look I, cool. I have them on there. <laughs> um, but then after that, it's just regular standard nut. It's cut really, really clean. And I think that's really the key to having a whammy bar that stays in tune with some abuse. Um, Fender scale, 25 and a half inch neck. Curtis Novak. Um, I think these are the Gaia Tone version of the gold foils. Oh, very hip. Yeah, and then hip shot bridge. But I changed the saddles. These. Um, I think they're called Highwood saddles. They're sort of strat saddles. They kind of have recessed screws and a little curve, bent, bent steel. But um, you know, it's just a two, it's just a two-point strat style bridge. There's nothing really fancy. I got two springs in the back and a mm -hmm. V. There's no locking nut. It's just locking tuners. Mm -hmm. But that's a string change thing. Uh, master tone, master volume, three-way switch for the pickups, and then I got a mute switch um, as well. <laughs> 
And a lot of times I'm in, I'm in middle position. I know a lot of guitar players think middle position is kind of weird or like only good for one thing, but I like it a lot. I like it because these are single coil pickups, so if I get some hum, I can throw it in there and not worry about it. But yep. I also like that it's got cut, but it's got body at the same time. You know, and, and I paid for both pickups. So I want to get my money's <laughs> worth and use it at the same time. That makes sense. <laughs> so that's Don't let them language. Yeah, that's pretty much it. The body is, um, the wood is all Carina body, Carina neck, rosewood fretboard. And, and how long have you had this particular, how long have you had this particular guitar? This one I actually got in uh, April of 2020. Um, I was going to go out to that last NAMM show. Well, I did in, in January 2020. And I played on the coal truck. And the idea was he was going to have this guitar ready for me. And I'd play on the coal truck and take the guitar home. And I'd get out there. And he's like, Mike, don't kill me. The guitar is not ready, but can you play this one instead? <laughs> so I played one of the um, Super Cubs, which he makes that are really cool, too. And I had a good time. And then I got home after that. And then, you know, lockdown happened in right. March. And then the guitar showed up in April. And I was like, well, this isn't a bad time to have a new instrument show up. You know, a lot of time at home to get to know it and stuff like that. So. Yeah. But I, I used this on the last MSSV tour last year, 48 shows, and the last recording, and the second recording that Watt and I did with Jim Keltner called Everyone We Go. That's all this guitar, too. Cool. Hey, I'm just going to make a quick, I, I really want to talk about your effects, but before I do that, I just want to ask you about what, what, the, what the sort of philosophy or, or the, the founding principle was for the band. You know, did you guys have a thing moving in? I oh, feel like you did. Well, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, you know, the band kind of started, the first record that Watt and I made with Jim Keltner was called Wall of Flowers, and we did that at my friend's uh, studio in Long Beach, Big Ego Studios, our, our Chris Schlarb producer. And when that record came out, I wanted to do some dates. And Jim, uh, he doesn't really travel for playing too much anymore. So I was talking to Watt, like I'd still like to do some gigs. And I first thing I thought of was Stephen Hodges because of uh, Watt's first opera called Contemplating the Engine Room, which is Watt, Hodges, and our buddy Nels Klein. And that record had a huge impact on me. I mean, that's one of my top five touchstone records, along with um, David Torn, What Means Solid Traveler, and a few others. And so I, he gave me Hodge's number, and I got in touch with him. And he was playing in Mavis Staples Band at the time, and they were playing in Chattanooga. I was living in Knoxville, so I drove down, and you know we met up for breakfast or something. I, I think he just wanted to make sure I wasn't like an axe murderer or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I, I wasn't, as it turns out. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he agreed to do this tour, which was 10 shows in 10 days from coast to coast. We played all the way from LA to um, New York City. And uh, I think maybe we did some of the music from Wall of Flowers. We did uh, Stooges' tune. We did some music from Contemplating the Engine Room, a couple of Watts songs. We did uh, a song called Pink Room that Hodges is on from the David Lynch uh, Fire Walk With Me uh, soundtrack. And uh, you know, we were just kind of getting enough material to do the gigs. And I think halfway through, the realization was like, man, I'm kind of be foolish to not write music specifically for these guys because it's such a different band when you change one person. It didn't sound like that record, and nor should it. I mean, Hodges is like a totally different player. Yeah. So we agreed, yeah, that'd be a good experiment. So after that tour, I went home, wrote some music just for thinking about the way these guys play, which is the way I make up all the music for this band. I hear their specific sounds and selfishly think about what I'd like to hear them try to play with those. And I send them music and we get together. And that's the way it's been going since. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And it's been terrific. I really have loved the album. Thanks. Thanks very much. Appreciate um, it. Why don't you take us through your effects chain? We forgot strings. Because oh. this is really important right, because of the whammy bar stuff, right. right? Like if Let's you can it. play if you can play a chord like this. Transpose them as you go. You know, I mean that's a good string and it doesn't really break that much. So these are D Dario XT. 10 to 46. Okay. Not the XL. The XT, I like. They're a little coated, so they have a little softer feel. But I haven't, I broke one string out of 50 gigs so far, and that's pretty, I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah, and there's a lot of whammy abuse going on. There's so. a lot of whammy abuse, yeah. <laughs> it's all sanctioned, but it yeah, happens, you know. Exactly. <laughs> well, <clears throat> where do you want to start here? Okay, so yeah, pedal land. Well, I'll just go in order, so. Okay. Um, the amp is really important, but we'll get to that. We will. We're going to so first literally get to that. Yeah. In order. <laughs> yeah. It's not lasting. <laughs> well, half of it's last in order. Half of it's in the middle. Okay. But so anyways, um, the first pedal I have is a, um, basically like a Mark I fuzz uh, by uh, Creepy Fingers, uh, Brad Davis's fuzz company called the Hold Tight. Um, and he makes new ones that have top jacks, but I'm one of those guys that likes the side jacks. And that's because 
is not obvious today, but I don't use a pedal board because I'm a klutz, so I just have to kind of have like a big pedal on the ground, and I can't have that many because I trip over them and stuff like that. So there's only a few things. So, but it's a real solid box, and it sounds pretty epic, you know. So there's already a little drive in the in the amp happening. <laughs> I like how it kind of folds over in itself when you really dig in on it. If you roll back, it does really good broken sounds. So that's always kind of fun to do, too. That is badass. You know? Uh, next in that, I have a electroharmonics ring thing, which I think is like an improperly like much maligned effect. Like, yeah, it's digital, right? But it, it's actually a sideband modulator, so it does all this different stuff. So it will do, it will do ring mod. And you can mix it in. And I like that. I think of ring modulation as like clean fuzz. You know, it sort of modulates these side bands and gives you all these overtones without actually being distortion. So it's kind of a good alternative to that. But it also has these settings where you can kind of go through and um, get all kinds of different modulation-y sort of sounds happening. And of course, since it's electroharmonics, they put a... a pitch shifter in it. And my favorite one... It's gone. It's gone. But there is a, a setting, one of my favorite effect sounds of all times is uh, in the Nirvana album, In Utero, there's a track called Radio Friendly Unit Shifter. Mm -hmm. And the intro is Kurt Cobain working like an old echo flanger, but it's got this really crazy sound. <laughs> You can kind of get really close with this. That's kind of my mimicking of like that, that sound, but I use a faster version too in this one. Because I don't want to pay like a thousand dollars for an effect that like is going to break and you can't find it anymore and all this kind of stuff. So this one does a lot and I, I really like it um, for that. And I also like that it has these presets, but they're kind of old fashioned presets. They just go in order. Mm -hmm. So if you need number nine, you've got to hit it nine go times. Go number nine, yeah. But a lot of times I'll use that in just as a solo kind of device too, you know. That's one of the things I loved about the old whammy pedals too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Switch through all the different. Yeah, you pitches. can go through them all and kind of like mess with everybody's heads. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and then uh, I got a I got a wah wah pedal, which I never really used before this tour. Watt wanted me to get one to do a little like Ron Ashton tribute for one of the tunes we do in the encore. We ah, do, cool. We do Stooges tune, and so I was checking one out. And I kind of don't like wah pedals at all, which is why I've never had one. But I found this one that's actually more like a synth filter, that. Um, Wilson Effects is the name, and this is called the Freaker Wah V2. Uh, and it goes from like real low, imperceptible, you can hear the bass sweep there. Oh, I need volume up on my guitar, right? And you can hear those overtones, it's almost like a Tuvan throat singing kind of thing. these melodies with the overtones a little bit and you can get it to be all the way down. And there's three dials on the side. What are those? Uh, this one is uh, volume. This okay. is boost, which I always have all the way up. This one kind of selects like, um, I don't really know, kind of like the, the limit, the upper and lower limit of the oh, wah. The, the, yeah, right. And the front one is like the resonance. Okay. So you can get really into that synth sort of, you know, overtone As the tone thing. Sustain, those yeah, exactly, grow and expand. yeah. And if you don't want it to be silent when the heel goes back, there's a little switch 
where it takes out like the lower limit, so it's kind of like more like regular wah. <laughs> which is kind of how I use it with this band. Um, but I do like having that option to kind of just totally delete the sound, which I think is cool. Which you know? song are you guys playing about? 1969. Okay. Yeah, but the live, live version. <laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so from there, it takes a little detour from effects because I go into uh, the Benson Vincent and I use only the Dirt Channel. So what's happening there is all these three effects in front they go into the dirt channel of the Vincent, which I think, I, I know it's his like one watt Vinny amp that they make, but uh, to me, what I th think of it as is like the world's greatest fuzz face. And I used to have a fuzz face on all the time, like the Hendrix thing, because you probably notice now I'm on the volume control a lot. I don't have volume pedal or anything. So, I'll shut this off. <laughs> so when I'm playing a lot, if I want to play clean, the volume knob's barely cracked open. But this is just dirt channel on the amp. So it's super dynamic, but it has that little bit of that sparkle when you roll off like a fuzz face. Yeah, does. it's got a lot of character. Yeah, so I leave it on the dirt channel. It's a channel switcher, so you can go clean. Um, but you know, I, I don't like to carry too much stuff either, so I, I don't want to have a channel switching thing if I don't need it. So since we're looking at the amp right now, yeah, uh, let's let's talk. Well, first of all, what led you to Benson amps? Oh, that's a funny story. Last tour, last year, we did the 48 shows in 48 days, I had a different setup going, and I had like a little one watt tube amp, and I had it going into a, a bigger, like higher wattage tube amp, and then I had this like, I wanted this kind of tilt EQ thing, and I was putting that in the loop, and then I had a two by 12, and I would tip that up so that I could hear it a little bit better, because we get a little bit loud when we get loud, even though we do also play really quiet. And um, at one point, some, one, of the, one of the parts was kind of failing, and I was trying to get it fixed, so I was borrowing one of Watt's bass amps for the Bravo, and he's got speak-on cables, and you can't get a speak-on to a quarter inch anywhere, so sound guys were like soldering these cables at every gig. Anyways, we get all the way around to Portland, which is one of the later gigs on that tour, and by this time, the rig looks like a science project on stage. <laughs> you know, the amp's up, it's like scraped up, there's wires hanging off, there's a bass amp, there's another amp down here. So I think Chris came to Soundcheck, and uh, we were hanging out after Soundcheck, and He's never like really talked to me about amps before, and, and he goes, "Hey, uh, you know your rig sounds great, but what is going on?" <laughs> you know. So I told him that whole story, and as I'm telling this, he's kind of looking at me. He's looking at me, and then I finish the story, and he goes, "You know, I make an amp that already is all of those things, right?" <laughs> and I was like, "No, I don't." So he tells me about the Vincent, which is the one watt Vinny, going into the 30 watt Chimera, mm -hmm. and it's got this tilt EQ, which kind of I was trying to mimic on the other stuff. And then they already make the vertical 2 by 12 so I was like, oh man, thank God you told me about this. So this amp, I think another band had this amp and they weren't going to use it, so he had him send it to me to try it out. I played it for a month and I gave him a call and I was like, all right, what do I owe you? You know, it's, it's really, <laughs> really has changed the way I play because I've always been into playing dynamically, but you know, the fuzz face is dynamic and all that stuff, but I've never had dynamic response like I have in this amp. In this amp? Yeah. What, what kind of tubes are in there? Um... Oh yeah, the two, the power tubes are EL thirty fours. Okay. The for the Chimera side, the dirt side is just an EL eighty four. Okay. And then there's a bunch of twelve AX sevens that kind of help that. And then there's Bring a six L six, but I don't really know what that does. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's a nice combination. Yeah, they look nice in the back, and it's real warm right now. Cool. <laughs> I, <laughs> I bet. Well, we're going through. Have we come up to the memory? No. Man? Okay. So we cool. go into the dirt channel. Okay. So that's the. <clears throat> That's the um, world's greatest fuzz face. And I'm going, now the effects loop comes out of there. So after that, the dirt channel, the effects loop comes out and I go into the Red Panda Tensor. Okay. Uh, and I have that hooked up to their four-way switch. They make, Kurt and everybody up there in uh, Detroit makes these really amazing like wild noise makers. And I kind of use this as sort of like um, my little sample sampler looper. So when I'm playing things, I like to capture material. And what I love about this is that it can spit it back randomized by pitch and rhythm and cut up. Uh, and I know our friend Henry Kaiser had a lot to do with, with that. Yes. Um, so that, that's a really cool kind of yeah, Henry connection has told me, also. Henry has told me that if he could only take one pedal to a gig, that would be the kind Well, that's what I did when I played on the coal truck. I didn't have any pedals because I flew out there because I was thinking about this guitar and I found Kurt and I was like, hey, I'm about to play. The only pedal I want to use is one of these because it's solo. And this way I feel like I'm playing with somebody else. Yeah. So I borrowed one and that's where I met Kurt. Um, but so, yeah, I love this thing. So I use it in a couple of different ways, sometimes kind of glitchy stuff.
And then, you know, sometimes if it's just on, it kind of plays along with you a little bit. And then I have another that's great setting that's kind of like an overdub mode, which kind of like is a little bit like that old um, 16 second delay, like the Nels, Nels thing and a bunch of those guys use, or like Torn with the, um, the Lexicon PCM42. Mm -hmm. You know, the history of like live looping with guitar processing is something that I've gotten really into over the years. And this is the first tour where I've only been using this. Usually I have this and an eventide time factor set up as another like kind of longer form mm -hmm. looper. But in the interest of traveling light, I've only been using this and I haven't really been like missing anything about it. So if I have it set for kind of overdub mode, you can kind of set it to add material. So it gives you stuff to kind of play along with or give out to other people. And if you don't play while you do it, you get some silence mixed in. So you have more space to interact. Oh, that's great. The, the Red Panda stuff is just so transporting, I think. Oh, yeah. The particle is also just a delightful pen. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Everything they make is pretty cool, I think, yeah. yeah. And then that just runs into an old memory man. I like these. I have a couple of these. It's kind of all I use. I, I don't like using reverb because it gets a little bit garbled up in the space, or even recording, it's kind of a little too much. So I like, I do like having some space, and I found that just using a, a good sounding delay that can kind of fold into itself is good. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, I mean, everybody knows this. There's no secret what's going to happen. But what I also found is that if you're coming out of like a, a little sort of loop situation, you know. You know, you can take it out and kind of extend the idea of the loop into the delay and then you don't have such a harsh cutoff. So I use them pretty much parallel with each other all the time as I'm working it. And they're up here on my transport box because, as you can see, I'm on the dials. Yes. And I'm getting older and yeah, I don't want to get on the knees drop your hand and stuff. In there, yeah. Yeah, right. Although it's so dramatic, you just drop <laughs> to your knees. And... I never like it. I, I always <laughs> like seeing people do stuff, you know, up here. The knee thing, I don't know. I... Yeah, Torn's always done that. He's always got. Uh, yeah, for uh, sure. Nice, uh, in fact, he was on. the one that told me, like, you should keep it at hand height. And then I saw Nels with the, ta the whole table full of stuff. But yeah. I was like, yeah, I got to carry this around anyways with all the box. This is what I put all my effects in. Yeah. I might as well use it. So yeah. it's, you know, one less thing to worry about yeah well that makes you know? it yeah that's perfectly practical yeah uh well thank you so much mike i really appreciate yeah, you being thanks here. thanks for having us yeah this is really fun and i guess now we're gonna go talk to mike watt i think so <laughs> hey y'all i'm john bollinger with premier guitar so our rig rundowns for a long time now have been sponsored by Diderio, and i'm thrilled to be using the Diderio expand pedal board i've got this little guy that fits in my gig bag and like many of you, I'm changing pedals all the time. I love having a board that can shrink as I'm shrinking my board or expand as I'm expanding it. And that's why I love the Expand pedal board. Their patented telescoping technology lets me instantly change the size of my pedals playground. It also features a unique cable management system and comes fitted with loops of Velcro, keeping everything neat and easy to swap. The two Expand versions comes with either one or two rows, depending on your needs. So a big thanks to Dario. Now, let's get back to more rig rundowns. And now I'm talking to Mike Watt. I'm, I'm just thrilled to see Mike again. It's been a long time since I've seen him and spoken with him. And he's one of my favorite bass players. He's obviously a foundational figure in American music and in punk rock especially. But he's also a hell of an improviser. I, I love this guy, damn it. Mike, it's good to see you. Okay. <laughs> it's a pleasure, man. So okay. what are you playing today? You're playing one of your Reverend Signatures, yes? It's called Watt Plower. And it's the Mark II. And yeah, I worked with Reverend Guitars to make this. Maybe uh, first one came out in 2017. Now, we were talking earlier, or, and you were talking about the uh, difference between the Mark I and the Mark II. So uh, why don't you share that with uh, yeah. our viewers? 
his pickups. Mark One only had this, viewers. <laughs> and the Mark Two has this one. And then, so it has one and a half extra. Okay. Because when it's in this mode, it's like this, which is opposite of what Leo did with this P base. In the middle, it's like Leo's. And what's like this is this neck. Okay. Now, these ones with blades are called P blades. They're made by the Reverend Guitar Designer Man, Joe okay, Naylor. So these are Joe Naylor's, okay. And very aggressive. They got ceramic magnets. Uh, you know, the way they took this, I was went to short scale basses live because into the 90s I was getting a lot of pain. So they took measurements of a Gibson EB3, mm. a 65 I used to, no, EBO was 65. Oh. Because that bass got stolen with all the Stooges stuff in 2008. Oh, hell. And get this, this cat, right, maybe a few months after I'm playing in San Diego, his name was Dan. So I called the Dan bass because he gives me a 65 EBO, which if you know EBs, they only flew their first ones to 65 are the same, then they start changing. So his first ones, you know, I got to play the cream, the Jack Bruce one. And that's which another story. That's yeah. Another, yeah <laughs> thank you, Bruce Gary. He yeah. made that happen. Nice. Okay. But anyway, get back to this. So they're taking the measurements on these things. They have, the strings are closer together than Leo had on his. So pole pieces, if I just use regular P bass, it wouldn't, right? So the blades, that's, that's not an issue. Mm. Okay. That's, it's got a sound. It's, it's kind of like Leo's, but a little more aggressive than Joe, Joe Naylor. We were working on different kinds of windings, how many, how less. And we came up with a thing that I thought I liked. So, but then I thought a little more vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So that's where the thing is, when I got that Dan bass, that EBO, yes. which is an EB3 with just one pick. <laughs> he had <clears throat> saw him the way I, because I modified them things, you know, that mud bucker, I never use it. So he put his own pickups. He got Lindy Fraley guitar pickups. And they're the same size as Les Paul SG thing. So I'm looking for a bass pickup, you right. know, not with six pole pieces because yeah, it's four strings. So I found this guy. They went, we just lost him. They went. Yeah. Rio Grande pickups. He made him Stevie Ray Vaughan. He made something called the Pit Bowl for Steinbergers, and that's the same thing. Huh. So I put it in that EB, uh, that Dan bass, I call the EB, you know. And when it came to this, add some vocabulary, because they use Alnico magnets, magnets, and they're a little more round, a little more calm. So, like with Mike, I've been using this all tour, this one. Mm -hmm. Not even these babies. This is more of my missing man and other projects, second man, other projects. I think with Mike, this one fits, fits better. And in fact, he wants, when we go record the last, that's why we're doing 60, 58 gigs in 61 days, so we're all practiced for the last day we record that. Record, yeah. So he wants me to use this bass, so I guess it's, it's working. And no mixing. It's either this setup, this setup, or that setup. Okay. Bass, I don't think you can really tell. This is just a volume and a tone. With Mike's music, I use these a lot. Not only rolling off treble and stuff like this, when you lower the volume, you load the pickup, you lose some there. Yeah. I tried the active VQ things in the 90s and all that. I mean, you already got EQs here. You start stacking them up. Where's the real fundamental? Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. less. So it went passive. Th these controls work a lot with passive. Now, is this, is this the exact pickup setup that you would get if you were to purchase a, uh, a Watt Plower 2? That's right. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. I thought. It shouldn't be like, they're just getting a name. It should be something that Watt would play. Yeah. Well, right. exactly. And, and cool, cool. The, guy, the guy with the Mark I, don't get cheated. He yep. just gets a little more vocabulary. That's still got this, there's no trade off. That right there, if you got it in the middle, it's just like a Mark I. Yep. It's got a little more vocab. Yep. Now, you know about the Gibsons, they got two on each side. Yep. I'm always hitting on the symbol getting out of two. So, Leo, <laughs> thank you. I think you got it from some Balkan design, but I like all four on the same side. And you've also got lightweight tuners on this, That's, right? That's, well, hip shot, right? And the small headstock, but even more, because they took the measurements off of me. 
Leo and the Gibson people had a difference on the angle of the neck to the body. Fenders lay a lot flatter. That's why Leo Kwan made a bridge one of the first. The badass. Right, right. right. Which is making a comeback. First. That's right. Yeah. I think he's fighting cancer and stuff, yeah. and but he's the first guy. If you want to modify a bridge, yep. you want to add more mass and stuff. Well, you couldn't use the same bridge on a Gibson or a Fender because of this issue with the angle. I never see this talked about, but anybody who plays them knows there's a big. But I used it for a couple of reasons. I got on on my EB three the Gibsons I was using the little guys. I was just using a shallot, but I got my organ man Pete Mazich. Second man, to cut a piece of brass for a shim. So not only do I get more sustain and stuff, it counterweights it because that was a problem with the Gibsons. Yep, neck Everything from my uh, non reverse Thunderbird with the nice yep. headstock to yep. even the EBs. Well, with bass, it's especially crazy, but I, I have trouble with SGs for the same reason. Oh, okay. It's like, right. Well, this does that and the lightweight hip shot. And then they started, hip shots started making bridges that had different, you can adjust the widths. See the little adjustments in there? Yep. So you can play a narrow kind of thing. Rickenbackers have a narrow thing, you know? You know, not everybody's like, fa Leo wanted it fan. You know, he's making a base that people, because in those days, they, they don't even have boat, uh, vans yet. They're using station wagons. So they have to strap this doghouse. On so the he's top. Looking, right. Yep. So he's looking at, <laughs> really, because he doesn't play, just a little piano and saxophone. He doesn't play string instruments. But he's trying to make like a, a electric version of a stand-up bass. So he makes a, the, the strings fan out here. Also, you know why it's called precision? No, why is it called precision? I actually can't tell. It's got frets. Because a string bass is like a giant violin. Ah, uh, that's a right. a chin part. But, yeah. but when you put the frets on, you can be precise. You can get the right. <laughs> that makes sense. I, you know, oddly enough, I've never encountered that before. But yeah. uh, my bad. Hey, so why don't you in tell your us. Bad, in your bad. <laughs> where does the signal go after this? Goes to an amp. Oh, before the app, very before the app, like <laughs> before the app, you got a couple of things. Oh, oh I you do. got a couple of things in this line there. This is new for me. <clears throat> oh, so pedals. To use things. Okay. Yeah. This is something I think amps should always had. High pass filter. Nice. Why put power in twenty hertz? It's a waste. It makes muddy with kick drum. A waste of energy too. You know, what? Stuff? You want people to feel it, but so this guy, this Broughton, it's made in Canada, right? This little guy. It's a, a little bored up. So high pass filter. It goes like from 20. I, I usually put it at 40, okay. 50, but depends on the room. And who, who makes that high Brout pass filter? Browton. Browton, B-R-O-U-G-H-T-O-N. It's a cat in Canada. Browton makes them. Cool. Brout, Thank you. 70 Dallas. Yep. This is tuner. Okay. That mutes. No one wants to hear you. <laughs> and this thing hanging off the headstock looks stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm in the looks, you know, like the root beer. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's a great a finish. Candy Flake. Yeah. Because I was nice in the finish. dragsters when I was a boy, so I asked uh, Ken Haas. He's the boss. Okay. This baby is a uh, Ohio company called Earthquaker. Oh, yeah. Device. And it's an uh, optical compressor, but if you notice everything's turned down, right? No, The lowest ratio, the lowest sustain, fast, uh, lowest, slowest attack in the fastest <laughs> release. Because I want it barely there. It's just a little thickener. And this guy, Chicago guy, Sushi Box FX, this is a cat named Nathan. He makes them one at a time. Okay. And what, all he is is a tube, but he runs it at 350 volts because the amp is transistor. Okay. Okay. It's a, these days, Class D is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah, they've now, made I tried them. Pretty and, amazing strides. They did, Over the even decades. with them, though. I tried, because I used Dave Eaton stuff a long time, and then he went to the class D, but, but they, they're so fragile, they go into protect mode. If I, because I kind of play like a thug <laughs> on, on accident. <laughs> but there's nothing worse, right? It would say, like, standing there with your dick in your hand. Right? <laughs> you don't want it shutting off. Can you, you don't want it shutting off. <clears throat> right. But you don't want to blow up the amp either. Right. And the thing is, a lot of these Class Ds, they're using the same ice power mat. It's just like the same way the designers used to use the same vacuum tubes, a 6L6, a 6V6, 688, 80, 80 in the amp. So they're working off so of the same but, template. But, right, but they <clears throat> put their own circuits around mm -hmm. it, so it's how it's implemented. Just like basses are using basically the same strings, mm -hmm. and, you know, but they 
they get their own things in it, so they have their own character. So Jim Bergantino near uh, Boston, he came up. I was just rolling the die. I was, yeah, I was using Crown Power Amp, all these Class D, because the, the big uh, advantage of Class D is the weight. Right. It's just 1,200-watt RMS at six and a half pounds. Right. Yeah. Blows my mind. Yeah. But it can't be shutting off. But right, right. So it was... That was the dilemma for a lot of years until I just rolled the dice with Jim's and said, I'll try this. And man, it held up and it's been, I'm like, tonight's the 50th gig. No problem. Excellent. Get this baby. So it's, uh, we were playing in a Tescadero and there was a sign that said, learn by doing. <laughs> Sometimes that's it, because you can read all the things, but put it in the thing the way you use it, you'll know if it can hang. Well, and you've always done that, I think. Yeah, I know. You know well, you've always done that. Jamie Connell was not just a slogan. <laughs> exactly, it's a way of life. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how I got into this stuff. But the compressor gives a little bit of, th but you want to hear like it's there. That's the thing, right? Yeah. It's, it, when it's off, you can tell it ain't there. But when it's, it don't, here's the thing about bass. When I was young, oh, four string, of course I was going to arena rock. Andy Boone's first gig is T-Rex. He was like this dog. Right? What was the bass player doing? I don't know. You couldn't <laughs> tell, right? Because no dynamics. So bass is really important. Like I was going to say, four-string guitar, but he said, right? No, four-string drum set. Ah. So you need dynamic. Yep. The closest note, kick drum. Yep. You've got to have the yep. case in point, the Fender 6, right? Mm -hmm. It's a baritone mm -hmm. guitar. It's tuned an octave down. You don't have the thick a bass guitar, because they don't have the mass on the strings. Yep. Well, to get that through, you got to have electric helpers. That yep. Are and you've got a uh, two by 12, is that right? That's a trip. All That's right. That's a trip. Like two by 12 was a surf or bandmaster or showman, right? Fender kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, you could, I mean, Tony did with that first Paruba album, but man, but these are different. So have you never played through a 2x12 until now? Yes, it, okay. yes I okay. did. Oh, you did, okay. But it was very similar. Okay. It's called Bareface, a guy okay. in England named Alex. Okay. And it blew me away. It was 40 pounds and did 1,200 watts. Mm. And the punch is no, again, no compromise. Of course, I'm less younger and crippled up and stuff. Yeah, you need the lighter stuff, but it's not, it's, a healthy dude could get into this. Yeah, it's not oh, yeah. just, Schleppable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's no for the to, sound. Yeah. There's a kind of new kind of magnum magnets, right? These neodymium things that react really fast. And I, I tried 15s. I did 10s for a long time with David and stuff. Of course, the 1969 designed SVT that everybody phones <laughs> on, but don't really work them or slap them. Yeah, that's the real. You know, Stooges, yeah. two of them, right? Yep. But they were rentals that were there. I never even heard first note till the first note of the gig, and man, half those gig, I could have been wrong because you can't tell what note it is. These guys have, well, again, the high pass filters helping, but they're tune cabs that have lots of punch, lots of definition. There's something the 12. First time I, you know, with the 12s, right? They were Jack Bruce was using Marshall stacks like Eric does. Yep. Was. yep. They didn't sound like these though. No, but this sounds great. And listening to it during sound check, the tone is like nice and round and beautiful, and right in the pocket where it needs to go. You, you know, and you what have you a think? lot of dynamic control. What do you think, right? It's killer. It's in the in the hearing. Yep. The doing. Yep. It sounds uh, good. I wouldn't have known. Like I said, yeah, it, it, it's just my lifestyle, but. <laughs> I think a healthy cat could get into this. Oh yeah, definitely, man. Yeah. And the way you guys play too, just I being able to have different. those dynamics on tap. Oh yeah, this that Mike <laughs> asked for that. There's the other thing I did that Jim didn't do, but he said it, he's into it because of my condition. It's not just speaker box; it's a walker. When I'm done with the, <laughs> game, I hey, the three you got some wheels on it. Yeah, a yeah. long time. Uh, this is my 68th tour, right? Yep. So I walk, but but by having them casters. And this is what he, he came to the sound check before, before the sound check in Boston. Cambridge, actually. Don't want to offend anybody. Right <laughs> Decouples from the deck. So that's another way you get a tighter sound. Yep. And uh, plus, I'm not going to manhandle or slip this thing, but it's like <laughs> oh, yeah. the walker thing. You. But it actually says hi fi guys do this with little pointy things, he said, on their speaker boxes. You know, the guys with the $500 wood knobs? Yep. Says they're decoupling their speaker boxes from the thing. So shows to go, you practical things can also be audio, you know, the very uh, sound things. Yep, yep. Uh, aesthetic, right? Yep. Aesthetic. Yep. Okay, so 
I also put different colored doves because my eyes ain't, <laughs> eyes ain't so good. He tripped on that. But a lot of the stuff is about function, you know, and just the way by doing a lot of gigs and things. Yeah. Well, you've always been really practical. You know, that's just, uh, I think, always been an important part of your aesthetic, right? too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, you're, you're saying that you're playing on the uh, neck pickup primarily yeah. for this for tour. Yeah. yeah. Let's, can we hear all three pickup configurations on this? Can you start with there and then work start down and let's get everything? Cool. Okay. Now the Leo. Now the kind of shot, the Schecter guys do this, right? Okay. But I tell you, Leo did it on his five. Fender five, no B string, C string. See how the bottom is? Because it's using the same pickup. Yep. This one's different. And by getting this here, see, what Leo did was he made the trebler more treble by closer to the bridge, bass more bassy, closer to nut. When he did his five backwards, now it's compensating. Now it's more trebly on the bass and more bassy on the treble. That was the last design he did. He got cancer. He sold the company to CBS. Yep. But he didn't die. That's why he did GNL. I know. GNL was killer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They he stayed in Orange County in Fullerton. <clears throat> yep. Much respect to that cat. Yep. You know, people say DIY. It wasn't just some marketing scam for alternative music, right? It was Walt Whitman with his poems, Leo with his. I think he yeah. took a radio design from. Well, yeah, thought, he was in his repair. He had a repair shop. But the art like taught shop. him about this yep. stuff, and it was weird how things work out. <laughs> it is, and we all benefited, which is great. So you hear the difference? Oh yeah. Also, when you put your hands in different places. <laughs> Carol Kay, uh, Jim James Jameson. Oh yeah. One finger, and he used, kept the cover on so it would be consistent. He hooked the singers up to the drums. That's his town. Composition. Yeah. That's another part of bass. Composition. <clears throat> yeah, we have one of his basses on the other side of town at the uh, Musicians Hall of Fame, an old James Jamerson bass. I'm, I'm a fan of artifacts, so it's always cool to go in and because see. Because the real one's out there somewhere, the one that says funk. Nobody yeah. knows where it is. Yeah. Because you know, I almost thought you said you had that. Oh, no, he doesn't have that one. Good. They don't have that one. But <laughs> uh, Robert found Jocko's for the family. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. He gave it back. He found the. That, yeah, That's something amazing. about there's some about objects. Yeah, there is. You know, especially you a little fetish that, on it. Well, they, you know, I feel like uh, an older guitar and an older bass are, uh, they have they have kind of a life. You know, they have a life that's parallel to yours. You know, and if you if that moves to another person, this is my supernatural guitar theory. If that if that moves to another person, that part of the life goes with them as well. It's like you make a new friend. They have a fully developed personality at that point. You know, from being played on for years, and then that personality becomes part of your thing too. Okay. <laughs> okay. Like if I use Vincent's paintbrush. Because you know he only sold one paint. Yep. You're getting, yeah. You're getting the... One of his landlords used one of his paintings in the chicken coop. So I guess there's all kinds of life. <laughs> <laughs> I've had, if we counted them, probably seven bad D'Addario strings in 30 years. The reason we only stock D'Addario strings is because D'Addario strings are perfect. It's nice to be able to depend on something. <laughs> 